fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on KCB, 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. You are back in the house of mystery, and of course, I'm Al Warren, and it must be Tuesday, because Dr. Michael Hawley is here. How you doing, Al? I'm doing okay. <laughs> you know, I'm doing okay. Now, today, we are talking to um, uh, an author, an educator, uh, there's all sorts of stuff. Like, he's he's got it all going on. Um, now, his newest book, um, on the release date of November 8th, um, is Blue Like Me, and it's Trevor Finnegan, book two. And the author of this, Aaron Philip Clark. So thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. How did it all start for you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean this in a sense that, okay, it looks like um, you've had quite the experience in your life. Like you took um, a lot of things that happened to you and you turned it into writing. Is that is that a fair assessment? I would say so. I mean, I think, uh, you know, early on, my interests, well, I would say it was always, I was always interested in writing, but I did have this notion early on that I would, uh, you know, be a visual artist and, um, you know, maybe draw comic books or something like that. And so, you know, I ended up going to art school and uh, while there, I realized that I had more of an interest in writing and um, I decided to focus, focus on that. And so actually I studied screenwriting first and then from there I studied fiction. Do you know um, you've got quite the reputation? <laughs> oh no, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> no, actually, yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, and I mean this, and I mean this in a nice way and people know me, I'm not really very nice. So, um, <laughs> but uh, no, I, cause we get like, you know, a couple hundred people like and, and agents. We've got a lot of stuff coming in and it's the show and stuff like that. And I throw a lot of stuff out at the co hosts and stuff like this. And when your name went up, I got four or five different co hosts saying, Wow, he's really good. Oh wow. Uh, well, and I, I mean that. So that. yeah, so that that's what I mean by you've got a reputation because a lot of times I'll have people on and, and they're like, Oh, nobody knows him or nobody knows her and nothing gets said. And other times I get you know, of course, there's like Dean Koontz and you got everybody and their dog coming after me. But when there's people, because I hadn't really heard of you before. No offense. I just hadn't. And then all of a sudden, so when your name was on my listing, all of a sudden it was like, oh, yeah, he's great. He's a really good writer. You know, so. Um, and I got the co-host. Yeah, he got the co-host. You know, he won the fight. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, but I but I always wonder because okay so you're you're doing this and obviously you're doing it well you're a good writer because other writers like and host and they they talk about you so you know that's a good thing but you yourself how do you know when you've written something that you think is good mm. well oh, that's a tough one I I think <laughs> you know. <laughs> I think it's something more innate, to be honest with you. Like, I know when some, when I'm writing something and I know when it's a little bit undercooked. Like, I know when I look at it and I say, okay, you know, this is good, but it's not where I want it to be. And, you know, I'll take a break, uh, maybe like give it a few days and then return to it. Let's say I'm working on a scene and, and I feel like, eh, there's something just missing here. And, Truthfully, nine times out of ten, if I just walk away from it, I guess you'd call it inspiration or, you know, what have you. But something kind of sparks and then I know how to either fix that scene or um, maybe even rewrite it or just get a little more out of it um, in terms of character development 
or a way to further advance the plot. Uh, and so, you know, I think, I don't know if, if that's necessarily knowing that it's good. It's more of just knowing that it works. And, you know, I'll leave it up to, to the readers to, <laughs> to let me know if it was good. Well, Al, I think, uh, what I think about it uh, with Aaron is, I call it the golden triangle, discipline, perseverance, and confidence. Oh, no, that's yours, Aaron. <laughs> so, but when I was reading on it, I thought, you know what? That is so true, you know, because uh, I can tell you teach this because this is exactly how I feel when I real feel confident about something. Yeah, I mean, it, it is the golden triangle, and I think that, um, I think, well, and, and I'll back up a little bit. So when it comes to confidence as a writer, I think you really have to have it to even sit down and write something that you intend to publish, right? Um, that you actually are going to put out there and say, hey, I expect and hope readers, you know, are going to connect with this material. And, and I believe in it enough that I think a publisher will, will publish this. Uh, and so I think that that's kind of the first step because that's truly what separates authors from writers. And I tell my students that all the time. There's a lot of people out there who can write, um, but those manuscripts may never come out the drawer. You know, you have to know that you're an author. And that means that you intend to publish. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, that's a definitive difference there. Um, so I think early on, you have to have that, that confidence. Now, you know, there's going to be stories people connect to and, and, and maybe some that they don't, or perhaps not as much. You know, we all say, Hey, we had that, you know, great novel. And then we had, Oh, that okay novel, you know. <laughs> But the idea is just to keep publishing. You know, there's no, um, it's not like the movie industry. It's not like you can write maybe a book that's not, you know, as successful as the last one and then everyone forgets your name. Like writers, we have a lot of leeway. We can keep going. You know, we can do a lot of different things. And so that's the beauty of it. Right. Let me, let me write this down because I want to make a career out of writing here. So I'm, trying to, <laughs> I'm, t I'm taking notes here so I can figure out how to be successful here. When you talk about, let's say, your characters in here, and of course, obviously, Trevor, Trevor uh, Finnegan is, is a main character here. Um, how do you experience that character? Like, is this something that you see like a movie in a head, in your head, or is this something like, uh, you hear voices or is it something totally separate? You don't, you don't feel that way at all. Well, it really starts with, um, it starts with kind of this seed of a thought that a character might have. And sometimes it's a question. Sometimes it's an existential question in, in Trevor's case, but, and he had many, he has many of those throughout the series, but it really started like that, you know, with him. And, and, and the question that, that kind of came to mind when I was thinking about, you know, I was trying to develop this character, this young police officer, um, you know, you, the rookie detective was what would happen to a detective like him or what would happen to a young rookie who was thrown in a particular circumstance, kind of thrown a curveball in his career and decides to leverage it for his own advantage, you know, take advantage of it, leverage it to advance his career. And, you know, I, I said to myself, well, what if it's, he's not necessarily a bad guy though. Right. Um, if he believes he's doing it for the right reason. And I kind of played with that a little bit. And I said, well, you know, what type of character would that be? You know how, and I, I guess in many ways I kind of reverse engineered him because I started there and then I, I decided to kind of take some steps back and 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 think about well what would his home life be growing up, and, you know what would have to happen in his life to give him that sort of mindset, you know so I developed his father and you know I had his father be a, a retired police officer uh, who had his own demons. And, you know, I, I gave him loss. I, I had his mother die early from, from cancer. And, you know, I kind of started with this idea of he's already a little bit broken. And he's seduced by this. I, later, once he joins LAPD, he's seduced by this notion 
that he can truly enact change. But first, he has to do these other deeds that are not um, that are unsavory um, and very shady, uh, you know, but he thinks he's doing it for the right reasons. And so that's really where he came out of. He came out of um, a little bit of a fear. You know, when I was in the police department, um, you know, I would see certain things and I would say, would I do that if if I was in that situation or they would tell us stories in the academy? And I'd say, I, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't do that. But then again, if you're in a particular situation, you don't know. And that's, you know, quite scary. <laughs> it could be quite scary if you don't, you know, you're not truly, you don't truly know what you would do until you're in a particular situation. Yeah, kind of a confidence with what you want to do or what you know you do. Um, well, how much of, of your own history with police and and being on the force goes into this then i would say i would say early on in terms of trevor's experience in the academy and really how he's having to deal with this changing department um you know i went in in 2014 in the police academy and so it was a very um yeasty period very kind of high energy just in terms of the fact that there were so many calls for reform. Um, and so, you know, I, I was witnessing a police department that was now reacting to that. And f- for Under Color of Law, that first book, I really wanted to capture that environment because it was a very interesting environment because training was no longer proactive. It had taken a, a very interesting turn where there was an added layer of you better be doing what you're supposed to be doing because if you're not someone out there where the camera is going to catch you. And that was that it had become ingrained in every training exercise, um, you know, to the point where you might have a training officer who's hiding, <laughs> watching you, you know, so, you know, it could be anything. It could be exercise. It could be, you know, so the idea was this, this, you, you know, you need to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. Cause as long as you're doing that, you're not going to have any problems. Um, and so that kind of environment uh, was like an extra layer of stress that already existed, you know, but now you have this other layer of almost like a fear because, you know, with LAPD, it's like, well, if you if you do anything outside of this kind of protective umbrella, you're on your own, right? So your union rep's not going to have your back. No one's going to have your back. So you do anything outside of what this, what the policy, established policy, then, you know, you, you better have a good lawyer. Um, and so I think that that, that kind of helped fuel for under color of law, helped fuel that world a little bit. Um, you know, where officers were, were already on edge and were already kind of, for lack of a better word, kind of taking sides about in terms of who's right, who's wrong, who's deemed enemy but at the end of the day it was the community it's all the community you know and so you can't separate that because that's who we were supposed to be policing and not just policing but helping so you can't make those those you know those distinctions that it's us and them because that's how essentially as a department you're going to fail so you know i wanted to kind of capture that for blue like me it's a little bit different because you know it's that a few years after, uh, you know, Trevor goes through um, kind of his crucible in that first book. And, you know, he can no longer be a cop, which makes sense, you know, after the end of Color of Law. But now he's a private investigator and he's trying to make amends for some of the choices that he made um, while he was in, in uniform and then as a detective. And he, you know, he he likens it to an albatross of of you know, I have to do this as this PI. And he's a particular type of PI because he's actually out there trying to find um, and investigate uh, officers who are not living up to their mandate. And they have a bit, he works for this law firm and there's this tip line and they get tips from the public because they're kind of worried and afraid. A lot of the community people in the community are worried and afraid to go to um, law enforcement with it or internal affairs because they don't think anything is going to happen. So he's taking it, uh, you know, he takes the responsibility and he says, hey, I'll investigate these things and um, bring it to light if if something really is going on that's that's not appropriate. Um, and so... 
So he's kind of like an internal affairs kind of person himself, investigator. Very much so, yes. Do you find that um, a lot of people, like books, movies, or shows and stuff that have this sort of center, you know, you have like a a cop, ex-cop, PI, or maybe not a PI, just sort of someone that was a cop. And um, do you think that this whole thing is is portrayed very well in in media, for instance, right now? For the most part, no. It, it, it a lot of it doesn't mirror how it how it really is. Um, you know, for a long time, I didn't want to write a cop novel. I, I fought it. Uh, because it was, first of all, it was incredibly close to home. So I have law enforcement in my family. Um, and then, you know, I was in the academy. So I just didn't have a desire, but I told myself that if I was going to, going to write a cop story, that I wanted it to be realistic to the experience that I had, that my family members had, that friends, um, have had and that I actually saw. And I think for the most part, when I have read cop novels or I've watched films or, you know, television, I've, I've struggled because there's certain things that obviously are, are invented, but then there's also aspects of it where we don't actually see, with the exception of a few shows that are, that I, I, and I can name some, but with the exception of like Southland or like Boomtown, um, you know, homicide life on the street. We don't see the police officers always as human beings. Oftentimes there's something that is more, um, I don't know, almost mythological about, you know, the, 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 the officers and, and, you know, this idea of, um, they almost represent a, uh, an idea, they represent a concept. They, they, they become almost like walking billboards um, and they lose something in that, um, you know, and, 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 you know, Michael Connolly is excellent. Like what he's been able to do with Bosch is he's moved away from that, um, you know, but I think oftentimes there's some the novels that I've read where it really just kind of leans into that kind of, you know, billboard and it, it really trades on tropes and things like that. Um, and it, and some tropes are, you know, accurate. I mean, officers, they drink a lot, <laughs> you know, at one point in time, there was a bar at the LAPD Academy. There was a bar on site because they said, at least if you drink here, you won't get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they serve donuts too. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it seems to me that whenever I see something uh, that's centered on police and their life, you know, it, it's it's either they are like you're saying, it's almost they're they're this perfect billboard of some sort of meaning, some some something, whatever it is, or either they're more like Bosch or Andy Griffiths. They're more of a there's a lot of personality along with the cop side of it. But I think in a sense, you you lose something in that too, don't you? I agree. You know, I think my approach has always been to start with the human being. You know, I'm more interested in why someone would want to do the job than I am about how they do the job. And because so much of the job, if you're writing from a very realistic perspective, standpoint is really like social work to be quite honest especially if you're you're you know working a beat you know you're seeing the same individuals who 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 continue to probably have issues in the community you know you're you're acting as a uh counselor you know a sounding board you're trying to de-escalate you know, you're doing all different types of things that are more about working with the trials and tribulations of just being a human being who may be having maybe the worst day ever or the worst year ever. Um, and so with that, I think there's a certain type of person, um, who's willing to do that. And it, 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 it moves away from, I would say the, the super cop, right? It moves away from that, um, sort of paradigm that's that's emerged and it's more about 
you know, just a human being who is trying their best to do their job. And that's, in my opinion, far more realistic than, you know, the the brilliant detective or the super cop who's hunting down a serial killer or, you know, or can get thrown out a window and bounce back the next scene. You know, it's not, you know, it's, it's, um, there goes my fiction novels. There, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, and, and that's just my, you know, my, my, that's my taste. That's all I think. And honestly, I think it has to do with the fact that I, I, I've grown up around it and I've seen the toll that it actually takes. And I don't know if novels, always um tap into that that there's a cost to it um you know there's something that um the longer you're on the job there's something that definitely is stripped away um and it's something i recognized in all the senior officers that i encountered and um you know it was something that that was just i don't know if it was like kind of in their eyes or you know, they would force, kind of force a smile. It, it was something that had been practiced to make it seem as if they were okay. And oftentimes you just kind of knew like, ooh, that person is not doing well, you know, but they're showing up every day, <laughs> you know, and they're. So, so Aaron, question is like your experience is uh, primarily uh, the LA Police Department, mm -hmm. which is probably massive. Would uh, so so your stories are uh, based in LA then as well? Yes, uh, you know I, I consider my my stories to be neo noir. You know LA um, set in Los Angeles. I have written about the South though. Uh, you know I spent time in North Carolina and and also uh, Philadelphia. And so my first novel was set in, in Philly um, in a small part of it in the South. But yeah, I, I think if anything, I'm you know as a a native Angelino, I, I enjoy writing about LA. Did you, did you ever worry about any sort of a backlash from people around you or cops you know or people that are in law enforcement at all when you kind of talk and write about this subject? Uh, no, because quite frankly, they'd have to prove that it's not true. <laughs> Well, yeah, but it, some of it, you know, <laughs> that, that, that in their mind it might be true, and therefore it might some of it, and so maybe they're not going to be pleased with you kind of airing dirty laundry. Yeah, so to speak, you know, you might be not saying any names and all that, but you know, if you're writing about something in a particular, you're talking about these these bad cops, like in this new book, and. um it, 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 maybe there's a couple of bad cops that are kind of similar and they will pick up that even though you're not talking about them specifically. So they might not take to that kind of a book. That's all, you know, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, I think I've, I've encountered more writers who have been cops who said, Oh, you know, you, you nailed it. Um, you know, you got it you you got it right or some people have read the book and every once in a while i get an email from someone who either had law enforcement in their family or had been on the job themselves and they you know they say well i wasn't really expecting you to go there you know um and to me my feeling when it comes to literature uh when it comes to telling stories is that it's kind of the the I, I attempt the, the three E's, which is to enlighten, entertain, and educate. And I kind of look at it as, you know, if someone reads this, reads my books and says, hey, I had no clue, or that's interesting, um, or maybe they disagree with it, I encourage them to explore for themselves. So if it's, if, you know, if I do, and I haven't, I mean, I haven't encountered any police officers who've been like, you know, you shouldn't talk about those things because there's a lot of things that I don't, that I edit out myself. I, I do self edit simply because if I get too into the weeds with, you know, certain aspects of law enforcement, I just don't think the reader would care that much. Uh, you know, I have to think about the audience. So there's certain things that I, I definitely might be in the first draft, but definitely are taken out by the time it, it you know, the, we move around to kind of the, the final draft, but you know, I haven't encountered any officers who have just been like, you know, I don't want to, 
you know, just say like, you shouldn't talk about that or you should, you know, why can't you just write about these other things? Because officers kind of know, like, these are the things that, that get talked about um, when you're hanging around other cops, you know, things such as, you know, police brutality and things like that. This, those aren't taboo. Those are taboo for the public because we want to believe that, you know, every, every officer is out there doing what they're supposed to do. But with a group of cops, like I had an officer tell me once, he said, I am so put out and disheartened by my profession. Um, he said, I just don't understand what happened. Like he was just, he said, I don't get the political aspect. He said, I don't get any of that. He said, when I was on the job, he said, we did our job. We followed the law, and if someone did something wrong, he's like, you would pull their their coattail and say, hey, don't do that again. And if they kept at it, then you would go ahead and you would report them, and they would be dealt with. And he said that's how it was. It was, it was you know, he said all this kind of, you know, blue religion stuff. He said, sure, it's always been there, but it's like you didn't want that person out there because that made you look bad. He said there was a different sort of idea of like community when it came to policing. It was this idea that, well, we represent this and we have to be able to work with people if we're going to solve crime. So if there's somebody out there doing something that you know is not right and is essentially violating their mandate, well, that actually is bad for business, right? Because now it's going to make it harder for us to be able to solve crimes. We saw that in Baltimore, um, you know, with the gun trace task force and the things that they were doing. Well, they couldn't solve anything. Because everybody said, you guys are dirty, you're crooked, you're robbing people. So they couldn't solve, you know, their their solve rate was, was atrocious um, because no one wanted to talk to them. So, you know, officers who are on the job and have been on the job, they, they, they know, you know. Now, maybe if someone has it in their head that, you know, officers are this one particular way um, and, you know, the, that the idea that, you know, a novel such as mine is now – you know, painting police officers in a different light. Well, that that's, you know, that's on them. That's because they've cooked up this fantasy in their head. But, you know, police departments are nothing but a microcosm of society. There's all types of people out there. To me, I can think of so much, so many angles that you have talked about or can get into in this. This would be like a perfect Netflix series. Have you thought about that kind of thing with uh, your protagonists or anything? Well, sure. I mean, we're <laughs> we're working on it. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah. So my uh, so I do have a literary manager. I because I screenwrite as, as well. So I work with uh, Bellevue, um, and so we are actually in the process of uh, kind of getting that going uh, to see if um, you know we can get some legs on it. Uh, the script is written. Um, you know, the, everything is kind of done. So it's just a matter right now of timing. I mean, you know, it could be, it could happen in six months or it could happen in three years. Uh, but, right. you know, that's the idea. You just feel that. I mean, it, to me, it just fits. I think so. I mean, you know, I think that uh, law enforcement shows are, are making a comeback. So for a while, nobody wanted to uh, touch it. <laughs> No, right, right. Well, don't don't mess don't mess with it too much because Al and I, Al and I, we like the the uh, the documentary stuff going on with serial killers and stuff. So don't mess. with us. <laughs> Yeah, we we have your number. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to um, wonder, but you know, because you talk about educate as well. So do do you have like a, a subtext or some sort of a meaning under? the entertainment part of it under the procedural part of it that you kind of put in is there something like you know uh someone picks up your book they read it and they kind of um you want them to get something i mean i i can't say that i have like a desire for them or necessarily like a motive for them to get something specific from it i think if anything i just want them to think you know these are just things that that de deserve time and consideration because so much of what Trevor has to do impacts society as a whole. Uh, so many of the things that he encounters and not just at, in his career, not just in law enforcement, but in his personal life, he has plenty of trials and tribulations that he goes through. And 
I just want to present human beings on the page. That and that's that's really the goal. And if people can relate to it, or it shows a slice of life that they had never experienced before, then I consider that to be successful. You know, but I think if I were to kind of distill it down to a theme, it would be that I don't believe heroes just appear or um, kind of come into the the literary world as as these, like I said, super cops or or just yeah, like heroic. I think that most people are human beings that have these true character moments where they show themselves as heroes. But I'm not so sure in my literary world that heroes necessarily necessarily exist. You know, and I think that it's a process to get to that point. Um, Because a hero is someone who's willing to sacrifice everything, um, you know, for the greater good. And that's, that's a big ask for most just everyday folks. And for me, when I'm writing, I, I think like that. I think like, you know, is Trevor a hero? Well, probably not, but he's trying, you know, <laughs> I mean, he's, you know, every, every novel, he's, he's going to try to do the right thing. And hopefully he'll emerge one day, maybe in book five or six, where we can really say like, Hey, like, you know, in the, in the way Walter Mosley breaks it down, but say like, he is a, a you know, a hero, uh, you know, that he's a black hero. Um, and that's, that's the hope. But I think that I'm more interested in the journey than having him start, you know, from square one, already having this code and being this hero- heroic figure. Right. You don't want him to start out like Mike there. You want him to <laughs> work, work his way there. That's right. You know, can't, can't, can't just be at the top. <laughs> what, what's your, what do you find your writing process is like? You know, when you, um, start a project like this and you kind of got the idea. Um, are you able to assign yourself time? Say, okay, you know, there's nobody around from three to five. Uh, so I'm going to sit and write and there's nobody around on Tuesday so I can write. Can you just assign schedule time and write? Or do you, do you have to have kind of the right mood thing going on? The right motions kind of happening. I would say it's a mix. I try to write every evening. So I'm, a, I'm more of a night writer. Um, and I find that doing that, and I've been doing it for a few years, that that kind of works for me. Um, so I'll, most of the time I'll start, if I'm lucky, I'll start about eight o'clock and I can write till uh, maybe 12 or one o'clock. Um, and then if an inspiration hits, uh, you know, throughout the day, I have a, um, I either put notes into my phone or I have a small uh, notebook that I kind of jot down, um, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll make notes or things like that. And oftentimes it's, it's, it's just maybe a line of dialogue that I, that will jog my memory when I actually can sit down at the computer and I'll remember what I was uh, originally thinking for a particular scene. Uh, but that's that's kind of the process. And for each book, I have a, a composition book. And in that composition book is kind of pre-writing. So I outline chapters and these outlines are rough sketches. Most of the time it'll just say what happens, just the actions. And then sometimes I'll journal. So if I'm journaling from the point of view of a character like Trevor, you know, I had a whole kind of journal entries about the loss of his uh, mother and the uh, relationship that was deteriorating with his his father. So I had these kind of journal entries for him. And that kind of just helped me inform his way of his his thinking um, and essentially his baggage. And so he carries that pretty much in every scene. Um, And then, you know, I would put that in there. So really, if anyone looked at these (laughs) these composition books, you know, they would think it was written by a madman (laughs) who has all these different POV (laughs) shifts and, you know, a whole lot going on and think, what in the world is this? And how did you get a book out of it? But for me, it just, it all kind of fuses together and I'm able to think, okay, I know exactly. I'll go back to this journal entry on this page. And every once in a while I can pull from a journal entry and that somehow will actually make its way into 
into the novel. How do you write evil characters, bad characters? Do you, does it get to you, or can you do it easily? Or um, it, 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 give us some names. Who do you know that you caught, caught <laughs> you write? <clears throat> you know, you must know some evil people, right? And so, so we 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 won't tell anybody. But if you if you give us the names, we can. Yeah, just like how do you how do, does it difficult to write someone doing really bad things? Um, yes and no. I think it depends on what the actions are. And I think sometimes I do pull from real police cases, um, some of them that we we studied in the academy, or stories that our our my training officer or you know DI told um, that just some things do bother you. Um, you know, there was a a, a story where uh, I don't I don't know how it came up, but we were we were. Um, training CPR um, and, and doing some uh, triage exercises. And um, our, our instructor, <laughs> for some reason, uh, there was a, um, there was a little dummy that was like a, it was a practice dummy, but it was a child. And so he said, yeah, you know, I remember this uh, family. And um, he said they, they, they just kept treat, mistreating their kid. And so, the kid was crying and they shoved a sock into the kid's mouth. And so he, he, you know, he took a moment and he said, yeah, you know, I really, really wanted to hurt those people. Um, and he said, we we're able to save the kid, but he said that was what child abuse looked like. And that's the first time I actually saw it. He said he had never seen it before. He never had to deal with it, but he said that was the first time uh, that he had to deal with it. And so I thought, you know, what type of individual would do such a thing, right? Um, and so it, 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 it becomes very taxing if you think on it incredibly hard because you can't fathom those type of people um, and the fact that they're out there and they walk among us, right? Um, but I think, you know, I have to always kind of detox that. And, and, and a lot of it was, you know, learning to compartmentalize. And they taught us those things in the academy and we had meditation class and things like that. And they said, you know, you have to lean on what works and you have to detox it some kind of way. Otherwise it'll kind of, you know, ultimately eat you up. Um, especially if you have to see that stuff firsthand. So when I think of evil characters, I often think of, um, characters that you just couldn't quite fathom why they were doing what they were doing. Uh, you know, but oftentimes to, it's not a whole lot of fun to write a character who just is, not redeemable, even if they are a villain. So I think for my peace of mind, just to stay sane, I always give them some sort of motivation uh, and reason that they're doing it. Because I think if I wrote the type of characters that we studied <laughs> and learned, you know, and that, that were prominent in some of these cases, trust me, nobody wants to read that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> unless they get caught, unless they lose, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can always drink at the bar at the cop shop and have some donuts if you need, you know. <laughs> That's true. We've become an amateur boxer. There were so many amateur oh, boxers yeah. um, in, in law enforcement. And some, we had a, we had a, a really short story, but we had a, a training officer um, and he would show up just pummeled, right? Like, I don't think he was a good <laughs> boxer. He would, he would show up just, and everybody acted like they didn't see it. It was the weirdest thing. I mean, we're talking about, you know, black eyes and cut lip and people would just, you know, not stare, <laughs> you know, kind of avert their eyes. Like this was just, hey, this is just normal, you know, but it was just, it was so interesting because whatever he was working out, you know, he, um, you know, he spent a lot of time on the canvas. So whatever he <laughs> was getting out of that experience, you know, he's, I guess. He well, maybe his wife was beating him. <laughs> See? Maybe, maybe, yeah. he's, maybe he belonged to some you never you know, know. dungeon club and he was, you know, s and and all that. You never know. <laughs> and nobody wanted to say anything because, you know, hey, it's like, you know, you know would you guys have a harness or something? You know, like, what's, what's going on there? You know, like, repurposing. Yeah, that, like, that's... really, what's going on? Yeah, well, I think you should, you should go in fiction, Al. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Dark Room. The Dark Room series. See, I'm, I'm helping you out here. 
<laughs> just so you know. So, you know, you can use my ideas, please. <laughs> I will. I will give you, yeah. There you a go. shout out. <laughs> yeah, I have a sub sub series called The Dark Room. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know because anything can happen. Do you, do you like the um, cop shows and stuff like uh, detective shows you see on TV series and stuff? And I, you know, lately I've been because um, I've been doing I do weird things, but um, not in dark rooms, but in um, I've been watching a lot of the uh, like Kojak and. Oh, the old you know, stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah, the old stuff on the on the archives. I've been going through some of the old series. Some of them are really good. I'm really surprised. I don't know why, but some of them are very good, and they're kind of like what you say. They're, they're very human. They're just they make a lot of mistakes. They they screw up a lot, but they're trying to do the right thing. And there's a lot of character throughout the shows. I'm I'm quite surprised. Quite happy with some of them actually from the. 60s and maybe early 70s. Do, do, do you have a favorite or do you kind of ever get into any of those shows? I do. I mean, I I think when I look back, you know, Police Story was was really yeah. good. Um, and I, I I really enjoyed, uh, you know, I, I, I went back and I started watching some of them and I was like, oh, you know, this was pretty sophisticated. The, you know, the, the storylines were pretty sophisticated just in terms of what they yeah, were. Yeah. Um, you know, dealing with and you know later on i i think that um cop shows like southland uh boomtown uh even uh luther on bbc uh were trying are you know trying to do something different and i and i i really respect the shows that moved away from uh kind of wrapping everything up in in uh you know, an hour kind of like, you know, people don't just confess, you know, <laughs> yeah. cause you yell at them. You know what I mean? Like if it was that easy, like, could you yeah. imagine like, you know, but just cause some officers, you know, screaming at them and they're not just going to cave, you know what I mean? So I, I really like, you know, the, the shows that dealt with it realistically. And I did it. Oftentimes people get away like, like homicide life on the street is my, is my all time favorite. Have you seen Hill show. street blues, the older one? Oh yeah, that, yeah. Hill Street Blues. Yeah, me. that always hooked me. Yeah, it was it was great because they were like you said they were human beings. And I my favorite episode of Homicide was you know Frank Pimbleton is played by Andre Brower is like this w- incredible um, investigator, but he's really really good in the box. Right, he can really really turn it up the heat, and you know this was his skill. But it was it was so detrimental that he ends up having a stroke in the middle of an interrogation. And I thought, that's writing. Because you see him and he his performance just in the box as he interrogates these, you know, suspect after suspect. And, you know, they all kind of are afraid of him. You know, he strikes something, you know, deep inside of them where they don't know what's going to happen. You know, he never gets physical, but it's just what we called in, in the police academy command presence. It was his command presence was so strong. But you finally get to see the toll that that was taking. And he has this, you know, this massive stroke um, while he's interrogating the suspect uh, and, and his partner has to come to his aid. And so, you know, things like that, that's that captures kind of what what I was saying at the start of this idea that there's a cost that that has to be paid when you're really good at what you do and what you do is police work. You know, there's a cost. Right. right. Well, because the more you put in into it and yourself, you know, it, it takes something out of you, right? It changes you. So, and yeah. that's, I, I think Very that's the so. trick to catching a, something good in a story. And that's why some of these shows, I was kind of like, wow, there's some of them because it actually caught them where they were struggling and it took a lot out of them. They came out of it a different person, which quite often in series TV, like you say, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it became formula, you know, beginning, middle, end, and it, it missed a lot of that. So I, I'm impressed when I see that sort of thing. Um, but I, I, what does it take out of you in a sense when you write one of these books? Um, you put a lot of your time, effort, 
research, writing, struggle, stress, ups and down, dark room, <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> so you do all that stuff, but at the end of it, like, so you get the book, like Blue Like Me is coming out here. It's all exciting. It's good. It's wrapped up. Fantastic. There's good feelings, but how do you think that the process of doing a book like this changes you? Well, you know, I'm forced to have to revisit certain aspects, um, you know, my past or certain feelings that I had. So every time I, I think, OK, I'm gonna, I'm writing another Trevor story, you know, I have to put myself in that mindset um, from years ago, uh, you know, and, you know, especially if I'm like writing his his, you know, a scene with his father and that dynamic and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, I'm having to kind of think more in line with, with a tired, worn out cop, um, you know, which is, I, I mean, I liken it to maybe what actors have to go through. Cause you kind of have to, as you're writing, you have to play these characters and, you know, you have to kind of at the end kind of detox it because, you know, I don't want to walk around with Trevor particularly i mean i think trevor's a great character and and is becoming more and more of a nice guy but i don't want him in my head all the time <laughs> <laughs> you know so so it's just a matter of of you know being able to to detox i mean i hear a lot of writers who say after the first draft they'll take like a a month and just go do something else i think stephen king uh was saying he takes like a like a month and and you know just kind of lets it go and then goes back, goes back to it. Um, and I think that that's kind of a, sounds to me like a healthy approach. I unfortunately don't have the luxury to take a full month, but I try and take at least a week. Or Doesn't two. craft beer help? <laughs> 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 it does me. <laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah. That's he's drinking. It's true. <laughs> I am drinking. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's, that's great. But, um, yeah, that's pretty pretty cool. But at the end of it, do you ever? Because um, you've had a few books out now. Do you ever look back at uh, your earliest books and reread them and think, "Wow, geez, I'd like to change this." Oh sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, <laughs> you know, it's. Um, I think that you're always a, you're eternally editing. You know, if you pick something that you you wrote uh, years ago you know, my brain goes into edit mode and I'm just like, oh, I would strike this, this, this. Because as you mature as a writer, you know, you realize like oftentimes less is more. And I think early on, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure other people may feel the same way, but you tend to kind of, um, at least I did, to overwrite. And I think that, um, you know, as I write, as I mature as a writer and and with each book, you know, I'm getting better at self-editing. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, as you progress, you realize that you don't need, people are interested in the story. And that's what that's what they want to read. And while prose is wonderful, don't get me wrong, like, you know, I, I, I try and spice up my prose by reading poetry and finding ways to just get at the heart at something with, you know, as few words as possible. And that's kind of my, my constraint. Like I put that on myself. Like, how can I say what I need to say in a very succinct, you know, albeit like noirish way where it's just straight to the heart, you know, Hammett master at it. Right. So like, that's kind of what I try, I try to do. So when I go back and I read those books, um, you know, my earlier books, um, I can see where I was almost there, but then I'll say, ah, you know, had I just cut these three words, it would have been a perfect sentence, you know? Yeah. 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 It's kind of one of those things. I think you could constantly do that your whole life. Yeah. Go back and keep rewriting new edition. <laughs> <laughs> it's an, it's the endless process. It is. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. much so. Well, so let's talk about the public. Um, do you hate them as much as I do? <laughs> no. Um, as in, like, do you do, you do a uh, social media with, with readers? Do you like to interact? Do you have places that people can follow you on? Do you have a website? How do you like to interact with readers? Well, truthfully, 
I, I'm not a huge social media person, but I do have accounts. So, you know, I, I would say if anything, I'm more on a uh, Facebook, um, than I am on anything else. I do have Instagram and that's at, um, at underscore write me a world. And then I also have Twitter, which shares the same handle. However, I most likely will be leaving Twitter as chaos is sure to ensue. <laughs> In the next few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like it. And I, uh, you know, personally, I, I don't know. I, I'm just sitting back and waiting because I, I don't know, but I, I'm sure hearing things like, uh, I mean, at some point we'll all get bills. <laughs> we'll, we'll all get, yeah. <laughs> we'll all be invoiced, you know, a thousand dollars for our Twitter use. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, actually, just that's okay. If you get a bill, you get an invoice, just send it on to Michael there. He'll take care of it. Okay? Of course. That's yeah. right. He he loves to, to, to help people out as much as he can on things like that. So That's great. By all means, everybody, everybody, everybody all just friends. email the – yeah, just, just email us here at the station, and I'll make sure he gets it, and he'll take care of everything. Well, right now, everybody's bummed at me because I'm a Bills fan, and we're doing so well. So yeah. I got to – just, you know. <laughs> just, you know, that's momentary. Too, right? <laughs> doesn't, doesn't really matter. Okay. Well, well, so we'll have everything up on the website so people can find you. In fact, um, I'll try and get your phone number up there too. So, <laughs> um, but uh, no, actually, so how you must have been writing this over this, um, pandemic i think they called yes. it the last couple of years and there was like some crazy stuff going on and apparently some weirdo with bad hair was president and stuff and what so what was it like trying to write um during all of that outside stress well i mean there was outside stress and then you know naturally you kind of have the inside stress um primarily from being stuck inside so <laughs> Right. Yeah. You know, it was uh, yes. it was taxing, but at the same time, and I and I can't describe it. It's like um, when you and maybe it kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. But when you know you have a story that you just feel like this is a this is it. You know, like I feel like this needs to be read. This needs to go out into the world. And I that's and I just kept focusing on it. I just kept focusing. So while all these other things are happening, you know, I, I told myself to be cognizant and be intentional about where I put my energy. Uh, and so writing at that time really became uh, like meditation because I was able to escape into this, this world that I created, uh, you know, and I wasn't, I felt like I was, I was able to kind of unplug a little bit. But and and truthfully, in many ways, writing has remained that, and so I I look forward to kind of being able to escape. Now, sometimes the outside world bleeds in, and um, you know, ways that uh I don't always expect. Um, you know, right now I'm writing a my work in progress. I'm I'm a huge uh, Patricia Highsmith fan, and I wanted to write kind of a a a nod to the talented Mr. Ripley, but set in the music industry and specifically uh, hip hop. And I wanted a kind of a sociopathic yet brilliant, somewhat brilliant character. And the characters changed a little bit, but I, I had this idea of how, you know, a sociopath would act in the music industry, especially one who had no talent and how they would leverage those around them um, and manipulate. And, while I was writing, I I have been focused on the number of artists, hip hop artists, who seem to just be dying every month, um, oftentimes violently. And, you know, it just kind of, I already had that kind of in my head. I was like, you know, there's so many artists who just kind of just, you know, don't seem to make it till 50, with the exception of like, you know, some of like, the older artists, especially like Snoop Dogg and, you know, their grandparents now, but the new artists can't seem yeah. to get past 30 years old. And so I, it was just so interesting to me. And, um, and a lot of times their cases don't go solved. You know, they go unsolved. People don't even, can't even find out, you know, 
who actually pulled the trigger in a lot of cases. So that was kind of in my head. And so um, as I was writing, you know, especially over the last three months, uh, you know, more artists were dying and, and that kind of led into a uh, little bit into the, the storyline. Um, you know, this idea of having success, success uh, and in the case of this character, this character is not really a nice character, um, but, uh, you know, this idea of willing to risk everything for success and to, in many ways, come up through, you know, uh, this kind of hard knocks situation only to die a millionaire at 30. You know, it just seemed so interesting um, to me uh, in that in, in, you know, this idea of, of never truly being um, feeling safe and never really being able to let your guard down, even though you you can do whatever you want. You have the means, the financial means to go anywhere in the world um, and to escape, you know, and if given the opportunity, you know, how many artists would do that? I, I don't think many would, you know, and I think that. You know, this idea that, 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 you know, ultimately do you go into it thinking, Hey, life is going to be short. So I'm going to have a lot of fun and make records and spend money and drive fast cars, <laughs> you know, cause I don't know if I'm going to make it till, you know, till, till 50. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the idea that I'm toying with, but, you know, reality started to bleed into that. Um, as a lot of these cases, cause I think a hip hop artist died yesterday. Yeah. So yeah, yeah there's always. Yeah. Jeez. You know. Well, it's certainly been a, a great conversation. I find it very interesting and uh really appreciate you being here. Now, the book we are talking about, you have to get. It's called Blue Like Me. And it's uh book two of the Trevor Finnegan series. And our guest is the author, Aaron Philip Clark. Thank you for be- being here. Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. It was great chatting. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.